Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net and this is another cheat sheet review session uh, covering videos 25 through, I guess, what, 29 or so? All right, so let's go ahead and add to uh, what we previously had here. Looking at lesson number 25, talking about uh, some of the additional common controls in XAML looked at the time picker we noticed that it had a special clock identifier that allowed us to create AM PM versus military time uh, clocks for selection the calendar date picker which just showed a little uh, representation of an area that can be selected and then uh, you click on it and it will actually show a fly out with a menu or with a calendar on it you can choose the placeholder text in that little um, that little area that you click on or tap on. Then we looked at the more full featured calendar view and this allows us to make um, single or multiple selections for the for a calendar. Here I show how to handle the selected date changed event and show in a text block all of the selected dates using this little link statement here that projects out the month and the day uh, it puts it in an array and then joins them together with a uh, comma. Next we looked at the flyout menu uh, and we applied it to a button but we said we can apply it to lots of different things and uh, actually just the flyout in this particular case it just would allow us to create a little um, a dialogue on screen we could put anything we want to in that dialogue I think I styled it up with a, uh, a stack panel a label or rather a text block and a button and uh, we can hide it once it's actually shown by uh, handling an event like a button inside of that flyout and just call my flyout.hide if whatever the name of the flyout that you've created uh, the corollary to this is the flyout menu which I just accidentally said a moment ago and this allows you to create a contextual menu from again any control I just happen to show it with a button you can create not only flyout menu items and handle the click or tapped event which I'm not displaying here we can create a separator to create visual separation a little line between items you can create a sub menu by using the menu flyout sub item element uh, or you can create a toggle menu item by choosing the toggle menu flyout item and I also uh, again point out that this little technique of the flyout or the menu flyout can be applied to many different types of controls you can learn more about it at that URL all right next up we talked about the auto suggest box and uh, this was pretty neat and we're going to use this here in an upcoming challenge uh, here we have the um, we can change the query icon by default uh, we set it to um, here, well, we, have that. we set it to a little magnifying glass the find query icon we also changed the placeholder text but the real power is in this text changed event handler which we handle here you can see uh, this time we're just going to go against a simple array of strings and we filter it using a where link clause then we um, add those items to an array and set them as the item source for our auto suggest box and that as we type additional letters it will reduce the number of options then we can use the arrow keys to select uh, one of the items then I'm just going to paste these three in together even though they're not necessarily related uh, we looked at the slider control which is used often uh, in the settings panel uh, in Windows 10 the progress bar uh, where we can set the maximum and the minimum or I'm sorry just the maximum for the progress bar here I created a binding statement we'll talk about X bind a little bit a little bit later we bound it to the slider value so that when we move the slider we were also moving the progress bar if we didn't want to do that we could just manually set the value attribute of the progress bar uh, in C sharp or whatever and then finally showed the progress ring and we can turn on that progress ring by setting is active to true or we can stop it and no longer display it setting it to false alright next up uh, in the next lesson we talked about the scroll viewer and this is going to be a crucial item as well it allows us to uh, add a number of items that are uh, 
that don't uh, display in the current window size uh, and give us scrolling ability uh, horizontally and vertical vertically to uh, to look around that window so uh, here I'm setting the horizontal scroll bar visibility to auto but you can also say hidden uh, or always on and then I said you can put anything you want to inside the scroll viewer but the scroll viewer cannot be inside of a stack panel if you put it inside of a stack panel it won't do anything at all okay um, next up we talked about the canvas and shapes let me just paste in the first well, let me just paste in the whole thing here. Uh, and I just wanted to cover this for the sake of completeness. The canvas allows you to do absolute positioning via attached properties. So unlike uh, the relative panel or even the grid and the stack panel, uh, the canvas is for absolute positioning. We said typically that's not a great thing, a great way to use it, but it does have its uses especially when combined with some of the um, the line, the rectangle, the ellipse for doing drawing or any kind of diagramming or anything that has a visual component to it. Should you have to use the line, the line we could uh, actually utilize this outside of the canvas, but the polyline, uh, you'll notice that we, were able, we used the canvas to set the top and the left hand corner as an offset and then filled in the points uh, X, Y point positions in order to create a triangle. Uh, and then also we talked about uh, the rectangle and ellipse. I think we've used those before in this series, just didn't really talk about them. Then finally talked about the canvas's attached property called Z-index. And essentially, if you think about um, everything we're looking at is flat, but what if we were to turn it 3D and then we were able to see the order in which things were stacked and kind of sitting on top of each other, that's what Z-index does. Uh, the higher the number, the higher up in the stack it is, the more it covers. Okay. And uh, next up we talked about XAML styles. Um, first of all, we started by just looking at um, resources we created like for example a solid color brush gave it a key and then uh, set its particular attribute in this case the color um, and so we can use this everywhere that we want to uh, use this accent color of brown um, just by referencing the key and then if we need to change that color from brown to red in the future nothing changes all we got to do is just change it in one little spot here and it changes it for the entire application uh, styles are kind of like those resources on steroids. They allow us to set multiple attributes all at once uh, by giving it a key and identifying a target type. So this particular style is generated specifically for a button. Now the way that you actually apply these things is through a binding statement and the binding statement will look like this where you have the open and close and curly braces the word static resource and then the name of the resource so it could be the style key or the resource key my brush or my button style uh, and then we talked about creating these re uh, these resource dictionaries at multiple levels at the page at the application but then also we said you could um, create a resource dictionary file. I showed you how to do that by going to um, the project, add new item, and then resource dictionary was one of the options there. So we added a new file called dictionary1.xaml and then we defined a solid color brush there and used it in our application. And uh, the way you use it is to merge those resource dictionaries that you define together. In this case, not only did I add the dictionary1.xaml to this particular page, but then also one I'm not displaying on this cheat sheet called dictionary2. And then I can, in the rest of the page, reference any of the styles that, uh, that were created either at the page, the application, or any of the two resource dictionaries that we have. And resource dictionaries, again, help us manage lots of styles. We can reuse them in multiple projects. Uh, we can, they're, used, they're great for organization, uh, things of that nature. And then finally, we just talked about themes. Uh, let me give you a nice URL for learning more about theme resources. Uh, essentially, if you find something that is a binding statement with theme resource, you can take a look at that style 
by putting your mouse cursor on it, hit F12, and that'll open up a file called generic.xaml. And so we saw where there were a couple of different um, styles that we could choose from uh, that would allow us to utilize the the colors, the theme colors that were selected by the user, whether on the desktop or the phone or even an Xbox One. Uh, in addition to that, we can also request a theme. We saw how by default our application requests the light theme, but we changed it to dark and saw what the impact was. However, in all cases regarding themes and styles, high contrast themes will override because there, it's really a usability issue. Uh, finally, um, we talked that uh, we talked about the fact that there are lots of different themes, not just for colors, but then also for things like um, font styles. And so, to illustrate this, we went to the properties window, went to the style property, clicked the little designer. It popped open, um, you know, a contextual menu that allowed us to select from several uh, styles that were predefined. We chose the header text block style and some of the others, and we saw how now it uh, shared this, um, our text block shared the same style as other um, items that we would see typically in Windows 10. And then finally, many of the styles that were defined in the generic.xaml had this based on attribute that that kind of created a baseline style, and then there would be styles that derive from that style based on that original style and then add or change some of the attributes. So it's very much like cascading style sheets in a sense. Um, and if you're familiar with that in web development, this should feel pretty, uh, pretty similar. Okay, so quick review. Hopefully all those concepts make sense and we're moving on and uh, continuing to add complexity. You're doing great, hang in there. I don't know that we're about halfway done yet, but we're getting close. All right. So we'll uh, we'll see in the next lesson where we start moving on to some advanced content. See you there. Thanks.